Hey, welcome home, everybody. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. We're so glad to have you with us today on this broadcast. I'm excited about the word that you're going to hear today. We have been meditating all this year on the word of the Lord to this church, Legacy Church, here in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. And I believe it's to all the partners of Pearsons Ministries International and really to anybody who will grab hold of it. The Lord spoke to us in the days leading up to the beginning of 2021, and He said this year would be a year that you would live life more abundantly, more life than you've ever lived before. And we're excited about that. And we've been go getting into the Word here in church and on this broadcast for the last number of weeks since the beginning of the year, uh, looking for that life. Because if that's true, if Jesus really did come to give us life and life more abundantly, then our next question should be, okay, Jesus, where do we go get it? How do we get a hold of it? And he said in the book of John chapter 6, verse 63, it's the Spirit who gives life. He said the flesh profits nothing. So if you want to be living life and life more abundantly, you've got to know that it comes up and out of the spirit that's in you and it cannot be found in and of and through this flesh. That's what we're going to start talking about today on this broadcast. Talking about worshiping him in spirit and truth. Talking about living in the spirit. It's going to take us uh, a couple of weeks to get this entire message, but I want you to get ready to hear from God today. As we look to his word, I'm believing today that you will have open eyes and open ears and an open heart to receive from him. Because what we're talking about is life changing. It's destiny altering truth. His spirit and his spirit in you is where you draw that life from. And there is life more abundantly, more life than you've ever lived before. And there's got to be more to this life than just a, a heart beating in your chest. There's got to be more to this life. Have you ever said that before? Have you ever, have you ever thought to yourself, man, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Well, the reason you think that is because there's more, praise God. There's more life available, but you got to know where to find it. And that's what we're going to talk about today and on into next week's broadcast. Before we get into that, I want to give you another opportunity today to sow into the ongoing outreaches of this ministry. If this ministry has been uh, a, a source of strength to you or a channel of life to you, if the Lord's connected us together, then I encourage you, go before him today and find out if you've got an assignment to partner with us in this ministry. I know many of you watching today, you are partners with us. Man, we thank God for you. God has been so good to us. And over and over again, he's done it through you, our partners, and your faithfulness. Father, thank you so much today for the giving of the people and the people that you've added to us. We call them blessed and increased and multiplied in Jesus' name. There's a number of ways you can get involved with us. If you're watching inside the United States and you've got an offering that you'd like to text, you can do that by texting LTV and any dollar amount to the number 28950. If you uh, would like to give online, you could do that at pearsonsministries.com. Or if you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Pearson's Ministries and use the address that you see right there on your screen. Come on, let's get into the Word of God together today. we got some good things to celebrate, some good things that God's doing in the life of this church and our partners here in this church and around the world. Then we'll get into the Word, and I'll be back at the end of this broadcast. It's time for some glory stories this morning. I love this one. It says, I wanted to share a glory story that happened in January 2021. I had a missions trip coming up that I needed to pay for, and I had no way of doing it in the natural. I was believing God for twice the cost of the trip to cover the week of work I would miss, as well as to bless somebody else. Now, that's a good thing, right? Believe in God to not only take care of your needs and my needs, but to bless somebody else. That's pretty good. It says, um, for the last few months, I had been fundraising a little money here, a little money there, but still remarkably short of what I was believing for. The first weekend of this year, I decided to turn off my phone. That can be a good thing sometimes too, huh? 
I like how these testimonies like preach themselves, right? I decided to turn off my phone and seek the Lord about some questions that I had. The Lord quickened to me, Matthew 7, 7 through 8, that everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and he who knocks, the door will be open to him. I really had to fight to just sit with him and keep my mind on the promise as I was waiting for those answers. You know, sometimes it does take a little fight to enter into the rest. And you have to sit there until you get at rest. It says, in that weekend, I received exactly the amount that I was believing God for and then some. I was able to pay for my missions trip in full and pay for two-thirds of someone else's trip who was on my team. Glory to God. God has continued to show himself faithful in his promises. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In the book of John, chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it how? More abundantly. That's our word. Somebody say, that's my word. That word is what's setting the tone for us this year. And I, you can tell from some of these reports that Sarah's ministering to us. Um, I can attest to it. This is working in our lives. Life more abundantly is working in our home, in the Pearson's house, I think more than it ever has before. And I know it's because not only did the Lord give us this word, but we believed it. We just took it. He said it and we said, okay. Man, there's a lot of power in that. Okay. Whatever you want. We're with you because we know you're with us. You're for us. And th that, that man named Abraham that the Bible talks so much about. And the Bible says that it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And his whole life and their whole marriage and their family is just such a testimony of the faithfulness of God. But it's a testimony of their own faith. Their own faith. Like Sarah said earlier, he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Didn't consider his own body now dead nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. He just, kept, he just kept growing in faith and growing in faith and growing in faith. But if you go back and look at his life story through the book of Genesis, yeah. this great man of faith and why he's, he's in the New Testament, he's in Hebrews 11 and he's in Romans 4, you go back and look at it and it's so simple. Every time God said do something, you know what he said? Okay. Okay. That's why this man's in the book because he took that step. And God, one thing after another, showed up in his life one day and said, I'm changing your name. I don't know what he was, 80, 90 years old at that point. That's a long time to live with a name. And then all of a sudden we're changing it, yeah. right? I'm changing your name. You've been Abram, now you're Abraham, which is a fascinating study just in itself. God put his name inside Abram's name and he covenanted himself to him. It's, it's a powerful thing. But just on the natural surface level of it, name change. Name change. Oh, Abram could have been like, God, are you serious? Maybe we could just keep that between me and you. Because what are people going to say when I go tell them I changed my name? You changed your name? Yeah, I changed my name. Well, what is it? Abraham, Ham, you put Ham in your name. <laughs> well, why? Uh, God told me to. Oh, okay, sure. You know, we don't stop and think about this, but he had family. He had servants. I mean, he lived in a natural world just like you and I do. I don't know what the government and the procedures were at that time. I know how difficult it is to get a name changed on a legal document now. I don't know if he had to go through all that or not, but hopefully for his sake he didn't. But God said, change your name, and he said what? Okay. 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 And then he said, uh, oh, yeah, and your wife, Sarai? I'm changing her name too. Sarah. Let me think about it. When the scripture said God told him to do this, Every time God told him to do something, the scripture tells us on that day, that same day. See, he's not like a lot of you and, 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 and us who are thinking, well, Lord, let, let me think on that a little bit. Let me pray about that. Well, God's been dealing with me now for a few years. Why has he got to deal with you for that long? If he says something, 
What does faith say? Okay. 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 I mean, can you imagine that staff meeting that morning? When he's got his family there, and by this time, Isaac's born. No, I think it was Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael was born, and we won't get into the whole story of that. Uh, but he's got all these servants. He's a wealthy man, a lot of servants in his house, and he stands up, and he goes over everything they need to do that day, and oh, we need to get that fence fixed over there on the east pasture. We've got some cattle getting out, and I need some of you guys to take care of the barn, get it fixed again, and um, I think that's about it. Well, a couple of more things here. No, I'm changing my name, uh, yet God talked to me last night, and now y'all call me Abraham. Uh-huh. Yeah, God said so. Okay. Oh, and Sarah, where are you, sweetheart? There you are. Love you, baby. Sarah. That's you now, Sarah. And uh, that looks to be about it. Oh, wait a second. One more thing. I need to see all the men. Uh, circumcisions will begin <laughs> right after staff meeting. If I could get you to meet me in the shed... Yeah, because that was one thing God told him to do, too. And you got those two guys hanging out in the back, those two entry-level staff guys, circum what now? What was... And one goes, man, I knew I should have called in sick today. <laughs> but no matter what God said to him, what did he say? Okay. Okay. And now he's got this 13-year-old son, Ishmael. 13 years old, and his dad's in his, what, middle 90s. If you're a 13-year-old and your dad's that old, you're thinking, I can run faster than you, old man. <laughs> but his whole family, he trained his family to say what? Yes. Okay. You're God and you're my God. And that, that pattern in his life of yielding to the plan of God and making changes when God said make changes and do things no matter how crazy or how intense or how foreign it sounded, led him all the way up to after the time where Isaac was born. Here's the son of promise, the one he's been believing for. And God speaks to him and says, offer your son, your only son, as a sacrifice to me. Now, if there was anything that Abraham was going to be hesitant on and stumble on and get hung up on, it would have been that. But the Bible says early the next morning, he rose up and he saddled the donkey and he took Isaac with him and he took servants with him and they headed towards the mountain. And as they were on their way, Isaac said to him, Daddy, I see the wood, but I don't see the lamb. I don't see the sacrifice. And Abraham, Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And you know as well as I do what happened. He got up to that mountain, and it was just him and Isaac, and he began to put Isaac on that altar and tie him to that altar of wood. And here again, here you've got a, a young man, but the Bible records no fear and no fight. Why? Daddy's taught us. We believe God. And we look forward to the New Testament that tells us that Abraham had already received Isaac raised from the dead. He knew this was the promise. He knew this was the son. And he raised that knife to take the life of the promise. And the angel of the Lord stopped him and said, don't do it. And you know the whole conversation he said he had with him. He said, the Lord sees and he knows. And, and if you don't have the right perspective of it, you would look at that and say, man, what kind of God would ask somebody to do that? What kind of God? You say this is a God of love? That doesn't sound like love. No, no, no. You don't get it. He's a covenant God. And what he did was make covenant with this man. And when his covenant partner was willing to offer his own son. Now God was required by the, com by the by covenant to be willing to do no less. He needed entrance. I've got to have covenant right to offer my son. So I need my covenant man to do it for me, be willing to do it for me so that I can demonstrate my willingness to do it for him. All this was covenant. This was, this was history changing and, and eternity shaping. Yep. That moment right there. How did he get to that moment? He said, okay, okay, okay. At every moment that led up to that. That's faith. Glory to God, that's faith. And he loves it. God loves it. He loves it. And without it, there is no pleasing him. 
And it's so simple, isn't it? When he says, take a step, you say, okay. When he says, make this change, you say, okay. Now, there's a lot of stuff that he asked of Abram, Abraham that he'll never ask of you. He'll never ask of me because Jesus was and is that one and only sacrifice. He'll never ask you to do that. There, there are things, blood's already been shed. You don't got to shed anymore. You, gotta, you have to put faith in the blood that has been shed. Thank you, Lord. All that to say, God's given us a word. This word that we can live and access this life more abundantly. And as far as we're concerned in our own home, this isn't something we're just talking about on a Sunday morning. This is something we're believing. This is something we're laying hold of. I can't tell you how many times just this week we've come into agreement with each other, believe in God for life more abundantly. When something comes up, a need arises, a pain comes, whatever it is, we say, no, no, no. Life more abundantly can take care of that. That's easy for life. And we've been pressing into it. And I encourage you, if you haven't been already, do it now. Start today. Claim this word as your own and let it lay foundation for every step you take, every step, every step, every step. And you've heard us say it before, but Dr. Lillian B. Yeoman, who lived and ministered so many years ago, she wrote in her book that God delights in his children stepping out over the aching void with nothing beneath their feet but the word of God. He delights in that. And if you've got nothing else under your feet, you've got a word that says this is the beginning of life more abundantly. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Now, see, none of that was in here. He's already talking. In John chapter 6, turn back there and look at this. Verse 63, Jesus said, it is the Spirit who gives life. We're talking about life more abundantly abundantly. And if Jesus said, I came that you'd have it, your next question should be, great, where do I get it? How do I get a hold of it? And you would only ask that and you'd only pursue that if you recognized, I don't yet have it. In other words, there's got to be more to this life than just a heart beating in my chest. There's got to be more to living life and experiencing life. And if there's something on the inside of you that's telling you all the time, there's got to be more, there's got to be more, there's got to be more. Do you want to know why it's telling you that? Because there's more. There's more available to us. And Jesus said, I came that you'd have it. And it's like we talked already today. He didn't come to force anything on you. I came that you might, that you may have it. I'm giving you opportunity. I can give you access to it, but I can't force it on you. I can't make you believe it. I can't make you receive it. I can't make you take it. I can create the opportunity. I can put it out in front of you, but you have to choose life. Isn't that what God spoke through Moses to the children of Israel? I set before you this day, blessing, cursing, life, death, and let me paraphrase here. I'm begging you, choose life. Choose life. But he didn't make them choose it. He didn't force it on them, and he's not forcing it on us. So our question is, okay, Jesus, if you came to give it to us, then you lead us, you show us where do we go to get it. How do we start living more of it? And that's what this verse is about, John 6, 63. It is the Spirit. Somebody say, the Spirit, the Spirit. who gives life. Now, uh, the King James says it's the spirit who quickens, quickens, quickens. You remember we read that last week in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 119, verse after verse after verse. He quickens me according to his word. You quicken me according to your testimonies. You quicken me. The new King James says you revive me. It just means bring back to life. That's what this word means, quicken, to come alive, Right? And Jesus said, it's the spirit who quickens. It's the spirit who gives life or brings back to life. Notice this next part, though. The flesh profits how much? Nothing. nothing. The spirit quickens. The flesh does nothing. Towards the end of Jesus' ministry, or perhaps throughout it, but, but specifically in the days leading up to the cross, 
and his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, he begins to talk to his disciples about the Spirit. The Spirit. And you could tell they really couldn't wrap their heads around it. And that's understandable. Because he's been with them in the flesh and now he's telling them, it's better for you if I go away. Can you imagine living every day with Jesus and seeing the things that, that nobody's ever seen before and experiencing things that have changed your life and now he's telling you it's better for you if he goes away? I mean, try, try wrapping your head around that if you're one of the 12. You and I'd be standing there going, uh, you've been right about a lot, but you're wrong about this. It's not better without you. I remember without you. Right. And it was not better. This is better. And you could tell they're having a hard time understanding it. He said, no, listen, it's better for you if I go. Why? If I don't go, the helper doesn't come. The spirit doesn't come. But if I do go, I'll send him to you. But even then you could tell they were so grieved. And that's why he said, man, there's so much more I want to tell you. But I can't tell you now because, because your heart's heavy. You're grieved. Which I look back on that going, thanks a lot, guys. We could have had more red words. But you couldn't hear it. Let's not judge them, but I mean, come on, let's be honest. But thank God, that's when Jesus said, but when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all of it. In other words, he's going to continue the conversation that you and I are having right now. That's what the spirit of God was sent to do. Not to speak of his own, Jesus said, but to take what he said and give it to you. Do you know that the spirit of God in you is there to continue the conversation that Jesus started in the pages of scripture? To guide you and I into all the truth? And he begins to introduce the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why it takes the Amplified Bible all these words to try to just to, to wrap around the concept that Jesus was communicating who this spirit is and what he would do for you. The Amplified calls him not just the helper, but the advocate and the standby and the intercessor. All these different things that he wants to do and wants to be in you and in me. But Jesus said it all starts right here. It's the spirit that quickens. It's the spirit that gives life. And he said the flesh profits nothing. Now, I remember this came out of an encounter that he had with thousands of people. John chapter 6 that we're reading right now, it's a long chapter because a lot of things happen in that chapter. It started with him miraculously feeding 5,000 men and women and children. And these people got so full, the Bible says they ate till they were full, they were satisfied, and there was plenty left over. And the next day, that same group of people, we've talked about it already, came tracking him down. They said, where'd you go? We've been looking for you. And Jesus said, you're not looking for me. You're looking for the sign. You're looking for the food. And he said, don't seek the food that perishes, but seek what's eternal is what he was saying. And you could tell they weren't getting it. They weren't hearing it. They said, uh, basically, well, if you're not going to do the thing with the food, teach us how to do it. How do we work the works of God? What do they want to do? Feed the flesh. Living with flesh on the mind. Living motivated by meeting the need of the flesh all the time. The flesh is the prominent, if not the only voice they're hearing. The flesh, the flesh, the flesh. I need more of that food. And Jesus obviously has no qualms whatsoever about providing things in the natural. It was his idea to feed them to begin with. They didn't even come looking for a meal. He said, how are we going to feed these people? Where are we going to go buy food for them? It was his idea to feed them. But once they had that natural need met, that's all they could see was a, a way to get that natural need met, to feed the flesh. And that's why he said, don't seek the food that perishes. And they said, well, teach us to do the works of God. In other words, if you're not going to do it, show us how to do it. We want to do that thing with the Trisket that you did, and it just keeps growing. 
How do you do that thing with the fish stick? I mean, I want some more of that. That was good fish. That's the best fish I ever had. And Jesus said, your work is to believe. That's your job. And they weren't hearing that either. And they said, well, why don't you give us a sign so that we may believe? And then they said, Moses gave bread from heaven. What are they doing? Trying to feed the flesh. And that's when Jesus said in verse 63, it's the spirit who quickens or the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. The words are spirit. In other words, you're not going to understand what he's saying because his words are spirit and you're thinking flesh the whole time. These are two totally different worlds. These are two totally different languages. And the words of the spirit make no sense to the mind of the flesh. Have you noticed that yet? That's why the scripture talks to us about how God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Why? Because it's spiritual stuff, man. And as long as you're stuck over here in the flesh trying to understand it according to the flesh, it will never make sense to you. It'll look like nothing but foolishness to you. And you will do what these people did, turn your back and walk away. Why? Because the spirit makes no sense to the flesh. But Jesus is inviting us into fellowship with him. But you're going to have to be in the same place he is. You're going to have to speak that language. You're going to have to be in the spirit. The spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus, where do we go to get this abundant life? You go to his word. But well, not just his word. What else did he add to this? His spirit. Out of the spirit comes this life more abundantly. The flesh can't produce it. The flesh profits how much? Tell me again. <laughs> Nothing. I pray that you are blessed by this word that you heard today. And whatever you do in this life, prioritize the word of God. His words are spirit and they are life. And if you believe that about his word, man, you'd get his word going in your eyes and in your ears, down into your heart day after day after day. You wouldn't miss a day because you know that his words are your life. His words are alive. His words bring life. His words are your life. And if you believe that, you'd get it going into your life every day. That's what this ministry is all about. That's the reason this broadcast exists. That's the reason we have PearsonsMinistries.com. That's the reason we put these messages on our podcast, the Pearson's Ministries podcast, the Legacy TV audio podcast. All of it is motivated by one thing, and that's getting the word of God to you. We believe so strongly that his word is medicine, his word is life, and it will bring health to your body, it will bring change to your life, strengthen you, and whatever it is that Satan has tried to steal from you, the word of God can restore it. And a life built on the word is a life built on a firm foundation. So do what it takes to get God's word going into your life today. And then if this ministry has been a blessing to you, can I encourage you? Share it with somebody. Send it to somebody else. Get, get what God's done for you, but don't let it stop with you. Get it into the life of somebody else. Be a blessing to them. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll see you again next time on Legacy TV. Bye-bye.